Good morning, Mr. Chair. Good morning. Thank you all for giving me the opportunity to speak. As was mentioned, my name is Lori Levinson, and I'm here on behalf of the Innocence Project Network. It's a national network. Specifically, Cardozo Law School's Innocence Project, Professor Barry Sheck, myself on behalf of Loyola Law School's Project for the Innocent, I want to introduce our Deputy Director, Adam Graham. Um, <coughs> I'm also here on behalf of the hundreds of exonerated individuals who have been wrongfully convicted because of Brady violations, and we have submitted uh, notebooks and materials for the panel at your convenience to review. We filed these reports so you can see that there is no exaggeration, frankly, in the numbers and the scope of the Brady problem. But it's beyond this. It's not about numbers, it's about individuals, it's about people like our recent client, Mr. Cash Register, who lost 34 years of his life in prison for a murder he did not commit because prosecutors failed to fulfill their duty under Brady to turn over exculpatory and impeachment information. Finally, I'm here as a former federal prosecutor and on behalf of the people of this wonderful state. Most prosecutors want to do the right thing, but we have not had in place the rules and the mechanisms to help guide them in these efforts. So that's what our proposal and the information I present to you today is designed to do. And I'm fully aware that there's a lengthy process by the State Bar to evaluate such a proposal, but we want to get the ball rolling and get it to the attention of the trustee. So as noted in my written testimony, our proposal is very simple. We propose that the California State Bar adopt, and California Supreme Court, ABA model rule 3.8 D, G, and H. As I stated, California is the only state that has not adopted and implemented some version of 3.8. The DOJ, adopted it more than eight years ago, so it means that federal prosecutors here are using that standard, and every other jurisdiction in this nation uses the rule. And it's an ethical rule. It's a rule that identifies the discovery obligations for prosecutors, and it constructs a model where prosecutors know what they are responsible for doing, and defense lawyers can actually help them in this task, and the court can supervise and the bar is actually less likely to get involved than general complaints that are being made now. It's also a very good model because the judge can supervise up front this constitutional duty, and therefore we're not likely to have the flood of post-conviction actions that we see now. Nothing would make me happier than to put our project for the innocent out of business because no innocent people were being convicted. But to do that, we have to follow this proposal. So let me talk about it, there's two parts. Part one would be the rule changes, and that's what I presented to you. Rule 3.8D says that prosecutors in criminal cases must make timely disclosure to the defense of all evidence or information known to the prosecutor that tends to negate the guilt of the accused or mitigate the offense. Rule 3.8G is a rule that goes to post-conviction disclosures, and it talks about if prosecutors know of new, credible, and material evidence that creates a reasonable likelihood that the convicted defendant did not commit the offense, they have the responsibility to disclose that evidence and to take further investigation. And then Rule 3.8H says that if there's clear and convincing evidence that an innocent person has been convicted, the prosecutor has to help remedy the conviction. And that's what these rules do. Part two of our proposal, frankly, will be focused on the courts, but it only comes into play if we can get this ethical rule change, which is the courts, as they have done in other jurisdictions, will use a procedure where they issue an order 30 days or at a reasonable time before trial that says to the prosecutor, directs the prosecutor to search his or her files and 
the investigators as well, because the prosecutor is responsible for those, to determine if all exculpatory evidence has been disclosed. If it has been, great. If it has not been, this actually gives prosecutors a friendly reminder, an opportunity to fulfill their duty. Judges can be as specific as they want in these orders. They can refer to certain types of documents, payments to witnesses, lab reports. It also would give the defense counsel an opportunity closer to trial when they would know better to identify what kind of records or theory they have that they could get this evidence in. And this order becomes an enforcement mechanism where the state bar does not have to jump into every case because in fact the court would retain power under contempt to see if the order has been fulfilled. Prosecutors would only be sanctioned if there's a willful and deliberate failure to comply with the order and uh, the judge who knows the case best can judge whether this was just a negligent mistake or deliberate effort to disregard Brady. And that becomes important when, as you'll see in our materials, we have disturbingly found that it turns out that there are these few identifiable prosecutors who will gain the system and repeatedly take their chances on not disclosing Brady. So that's the simple proposal. Let me offer why we should move forward and encourage the bar to do so on this. First of all, it would serve defendants. They would get fair trial. They're entitled to fair trial. It would serve prosecutors because in the heat of the moment, as you approach trial, it's too easy for some prosecutors to say, well, maybe this would or would not help the defense, but I have so much other evidence and I can reconcile that inconsistent statement and I have rebuttal evidence so it's probably not too material, too prejudicial. I, I, I'm not gonna turn it over. This standard doesn't have a prosecutor go through that exercise. The standard under the ethical rule is, is there any tendency to negate? And so you don't have to worry about whether the prosecutor knows the case, knows the defense theory well enough to make those judgments that have been so problematic. Um, it's a, it serves the court and the administration of justice because our courts really are now embroiled in battles over Brady, and they are also filtering into the state bar at a much lower number, however. Uh, but it would save incredible time and money, and post-conviction cases not only deal with people who have given decades of their life in prison, but they're normally enormously expensive and take tremendous time from the courts. It would serve the state bar because we all want the highest ethics for our prosecutors. We also hope for a collaborative approach through these ethical rules of giving everybody to move in the right direction. And finally, it serves the public. Yes, this ethical rule is for the public's sake because we need to keep in mind that if we wrongfully convict people who are innocent, that actually means that the guilty offenders are still out on the street potentially hurting other people and escaping justice that they should face. So let me finish by anticipating maybe a few of the questions you might have. Uh, one was, why was this a rule uh, not adopted in California when it has been adopted throughout the nation? I think the simple answer to that is California has been very busy trying to revamp all of its rules and we're still back to the starting place. And yet, I take a look at this rule and say, this frankly isn't one that can wait. There is going to be a delay between now and we do the overhaul of the rules. But each day, we have a problem with these injustice, as in your material. Second question, why isn't it enough just to tell prosecutors to fulfill, meet your constitutional duties under Brady and Giglio? Because we hear that all the time. And that's because of that materiality aspect that's a problem. That Brady and Giggly are designed to have a court look after the fact to see if failure to turn over evidence made an impact on the case. But by that time, of course, people have spent years in prison and it might be even too far too late to show that. This is a preventative measure where prosecutors are said, one standard, does it tend to exonerate? Third question, 
What about situations where the prosecutor has a very good reason for not wanting to turn over the evidence? Well, the rule says that's fine. And in fact, it provides that if it's privileged or you get a court order and there are safety concerns, you're worried about burning an informant, any range of concerns the prosecutor has, they are not obliged to turn it over. And finally, is the rule unfair because it only imposes duties on prosecutors? And I know our state bar rules often focus on rules that apply to both sides of the bench. But it's not unfair because it specifies the rules of prosecutors. Defense already have statutory discovery obligations. They need to fulfill those. But it is the prosecutor who has the constitutional obligation. And frankly, it is the bar that has the responsibility to supervise that to ensure that everyone receives a fair trial. Um, the goal is the same, only to convict the guilty. But frankly, and sad, we know today how often we miss achieving this goal. So I thank you for your time. I want to be available for your questions. And I want to urge the State Bar to move forward, to sort of not be the outsider in this national movement to take an easy step to prevent further injustices. Thank you very much. Well, Laurie, thank you for your most ethical uh, uh, disciplinary obligations. Um, President, State Bar President Craig Holden is appointing a new commission within the next month or so to undertake that task. The expectation is it's going to be a somewhat accelerated effort, not like the last effort. And I'm going to ask the staff to get all of your written comments and written testimony to that committee or commission so that they have it available. Thank you, Mr. Pasternak. May I ask one question? Sure. Um, I understand. And I, I did <coughs> Welcome. Good morning. Thank you.